Well, um, my name is Julie Wedgwood. I'm chairing this session. This is the session um, T5S6, if that's the one you're expecting to be in alignment in practice. And today we're looking at setting up your L&D department for business success. And we have two really meaningful case studies to go through um, from uh, Lisa and also from Lucy. So we're going to start off and Lisa's going to do her presentation first and then we'll do a few questions with Lisa afterwards and then Lucy's going to do her presentation and we'll do some questions with her and then we'll open up for a panel discussion if that's okay. All right, so I'd like to welcome Lisa. Um, Lisa is the UK People Director at Servest, um, which is a leading facilities management company. And um, at the, this company, she has led a complete redevelopment of L&D, uh, so that her L&D department is now very, very focused on performance. Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So um, I am quite aware that we have the graveyard sh uh, shift, so thank you all very much for coming along. Uh, we all do have to start somewhere, obviously. And I've also been told that some of you might need to head off early for trains. Um, I'll try not to take it too personally. All right. Um, so how many people do you think a company with 19,000 colleagues and a turnover of two 225 million has? Well, in November 2015, Servest had none. We had no L&D team at all. We did compliance training, of course, because that was essential to our business, but actually we, know we had no L&D function. So I was at a meeting one day with our CFO, listening to him present, and I was sat in a room. It was kind of towards the end of the day. I'd had a nice lunch. The room was quite warm. Um, I was feeling a bit sleepy. The presenters voice was quite melodic and you know my mind started to wander maybe like yours is now <laughs> but then a question came up on the presentation which really made me um, sit up and it was this so unbeknown to me that question started to move around in my mind and it kicked around for about three days and then on day four when I was in the shower the idea struck me. I don't know about you, I tend to have great ideas in the shower. They're kind of like the modern day version of Einstein's bath, I guess. So the idea struck me, and 24 hours later, I was sat in front of our HR director, and I had a proposal for her. I wanted to take on learning and development, but not as we knew it. It would be based on three things. Firstly, L&D would become brilliant at asking the right questions. For too long, I think Helen Deer have, have, have kind of thought they know all the answers. And actually, getting better at asking the question meant that we, be, we would become more effective and more aligned with the business. And after, after all, it was a great question that had started this ball rolling and that hadn't been lost on me. The second thing was we had to focus on performance. Individual team business performance. Again, for too long, our role had been to tick boxes. And actually, what we wanted to do was to create an environment where individuals could prosper and really get on in our organization. And the third thing, my cat was going crazy at this picture last night, I have to say, when I was presenting this. <laughs> anyway, so she, um, I also said that actually L&D needed to be available to everybody in the organization, whatever level, and it needed to be available in, in various formats. So actually, we needed to make sure that development and learning became an individual choice for people. It would be online, it would be offline, it would be face-to-face, -face, it would be however people wanted to consume it, and that was really important to us. So the good news is, she said yes. So 20, uh, no, about two month and a half later, on the 2nd of January, the L&D team was formed with our first hire, the uh, awesome Joanne Witzer, who is here supporting me on the front row. So there was two of us now, and we needed to get going. But the question really was, where do we start? I mean, we had a blank sheet of paper, so that was incredible and a fantastic um, opportunity for us. But really, we needed to start as we meant to go on. We knew we wanted to be credible and to kind of launch ourselves with a bit of a bang. So two months later, we were an ILM accredited center and we started our first management development program, which was called Navigator. And it was a program with 15 different managers from senior managers from all over the business. 
And when we thought about our commitment, those first three things that we proposed, actually we wanted to make sure that we deliver business performance improvement. So we thought, well, let's start with collaboration. And actually, getting those people to work together very much echoed how we as, a, how we as an L&D team wanted to work. Now, we're quite a practical bunch, so we didn't want to spend two days sat in a room learning about collaboration. We wanted to do collaboration. So we partnered with a great company called Pop-Up Business School. If you haven't come across them, you should look them up. They're incredible. And we also asked the board to give us a real pressing um, and critical problem that biz the business was currently facing, which was that. Now, you won't know much about our company, but since in the time I've joined, which is about three years, we have acquired seven businesses. We have another one on its way, I hear. So when you are presented with that, you know that something's about to happen and you need to get your skates on. So we spent two days together as a group. Um, we got to know each other a lot better. We learned about collaborative leadership and we came up with three cracking ideas, which were, these are the original flip charts, so uh, they're not particularly fancy. The first one was actually about a culture called You Choose. Now, you all know that in order to, for, your, for your clients to get the best service, you need to have engaged people. In order for them to be engaged, they need to feel involved. And for them to feel involved, they need to have some choice. So we believe strongly that for us to be able to get service up and running anywhere, we needed to increase the element of choice, the flexibility that, that people had. This was extended beyond our colleagues, so it's our supply chain, it's our clients, it's everybody. So actually, if you look at our workforce, which is about 90% frontline, hourly paid, an element of choice makes a massive difference to them. You Choose was a great idea, but it also made us realize that some of our existing processes didn't kind of fit in with that. So it made us change a couple of things. The first one was our annual appraisal. I know there's been a bit of a shift and a trend towards people getting rid of their annual appraisal. We got on that bandwagon. Um, I think what's been slightly different for us is a lot of companies have, instead of uh, meeting once a year, they maybe meet more regularly. We've actually said, meet as and when you need. And we have asked people that they meet in a way that works best for them. So if I think about how Joanne and I catch up, we're both quite fast people. We like to catch up on the phone as and when we need to. However, what we've realized over time is actually we need to sit down. We need to spend more time together. So having that flexibility in the process that isn't just this is when you do it has enabled us to come up with a much more valuable way of, of getting together. So... Previously, when you had the annual appraisal, it was quite straightforward. You got together on that date, you filled in this form, you sent it back to HR. If you sent them all back on time, you got a gold star. But there was never any evidence that there was a meaningful conversation or actually the performance was improving. So we needed to give people a tool that would help them understand each other better. So we introduced Insights, Insights Discovery Profile. And originally we thought, well, this will be good because you know you get to understand what makes each other tick and it will make you a bit more flexible in your approach. But actually, it made us realize something else. It made us realize that actually our business was set up for a certain style type of person. So the person who was the bold, confident communicator got on really well in service. But actually, the person who listened more than they talk and liked to reflect more than they acted was maybe overlooked a little bit. So Insights has done a huge amount for our business because now what we aim to do is actually look at everything in our people strategy in those four different lenses. It's not to pigeonhole people, you know, like Joanne. She is high red energy, likes to get on with stuff. However, we interact in ways that actually work for her. It's not about saying that's how she is. We have to communicate in that way. But actually, it's made us look at all of our people practices in, in that way. The other thing that we have looked at is... Uh, oh, okay. So... Just to give you an example, we now roll out insights through our induction. We have about 600 people trained up in it. I've never known a profiling tool be so well received by people. Normally, there's some kind of healthy cynicism around these things, but actually, people love insights. Dan came on our induction on the 16th of December, uh, sorry, 16th of January, and 10 days later, he's tweeting about how he shared his knowledge with his team. That, to me, is the success of, of learning and development. It's not us going out and delivering. It's when I see stuff like that, 
where people are actually taking responsibility ownership, that's when I think things are really working. And this is our CEO, CJ Green, who is you know, really engaged with L&D. So again, great to see her um, involvement in, in his activity as well. The next thing we also looked at is we kind of decided job descriptions weren't up to the job anymore. So they tended to be a document that you would share when someone was hired, or it would come out when someone was underperforming, or when they said, it's not on my job description. So we actually decided that in order to really align all of our colleagues with business performance, we needed to move towards an output agreement. So we've gone through this process. The job description was very much a kind of a list of tasks they had to do. And actually, what we found is the more junior the role, the more closely we were managing people. And we weren't really giving them the freedom or the choice about how they delivered their role. So output agreements has been quite a big change for us. But actually, it's the way we work with our clients. So what we do with our colleagues is we now say, here's the output of what you're expected to deliver. And then they have some freedom about how they deliver that. So that's worked really well. And again, we work like that with our clients already. So that's really useful. So that was our first big idea. Our second big idea was we needed a place where all of our colleagues could go wherever they worked across the, across the globe, where they could connect with each other, where they could learn, and where they could explore. We came up with Service Street. And we, so that was in March. In December, we launched it to 3,000 people in the security team. We told them to try and break it, um, which is always a good place to start. And we now have about 42, just over 42,000 people who are part of Service Street. The reality is this is an LMS, but never at any point have we mentioned that. If I, from the L&D team, said, we need an LMS, you will need to get engaged with it, we would not have had the uptake and the engagement that we have by having 15 people say, we need this, and we need to get it going. So it's not seen as an L&D initiative. It's seen as something as the business needs. That's what it looks like at the moment. It's evolving. And the future of Service Street will be, we're just looking at an ERP system. This our new ERP system is going to be called Service Street because of the, already the popularity of it. So this will evolve into our ERP over time. In terms of how is it going in the last 12 months, our active users are going up every single month, as are the number of course completions. So. We had a record month this month, ended last night. I did a final count. We hit 1,200, which was fantastic. 1,200 courses completed in one month, which is really amazing. So it's been a real, real um, success. When we were putting this together and we were thinking about who should access what, um, the question came up about which courses should certain people be allowed to do. And uh, I had a conversation with a consultant. And he said to me, you know, I really think that for the more junior staff, they could have the generic stuff. And then for your management, they get all the leadership stuff, but you shouldn't really allow the two to mix because you don't want people to get ideas above their station. So should we give people ideas above their station? It's not going to be easy for all of you, but do you mind just kind of getting together with the nearest person and just discussing that for a minute? Thank you. <laughs> OK. So what does, uh, what does everybody think? <laughs> yeah? Hands up if you think we should give people ideas above their station. OK. And who thinks we shouldn't? OK. Well, luckily, I agree with you all. So <laughs> we decided that we should give people ideas above their station. And everybody has access to anything. Because who are we to judge what is going to be interesting for some people? Our third idea. We needed some Eurostars, we called them. And this would be a team of people who would be available to go and get Europe going as and when we needed, needed them to. They would be our kind of customer service experts, the ones who would be able to train people up, get them motivated to be delivering the great service to all of our clients. But they couldn't cost a lot of money, and we couldn't have them sitting waiting for the call. So what we did is we created a course called Service Champion, a two-day program which gave people the skills and the experience to be able to develop people. It was ILM endorsed, and I would say today is still one of our most popular courses. We love it. We have 205 people who are now trained up um, to deliver service, oh, sorry, as service champions, and they are out in our business now. They're the ones who are motivating people, 
helping get people engaged and learn. And actually, that is how we deliver that. Going back to that very first question I was asked, that's really the only way to do it. You can't do it as a central team. You have to trust other people, give them the skills, but also give them the empowerment. So when it comes to aligning with the business, why I think, I guess, L&D has been so successful with us is we um, have... I guess, found a way of working very closely with them. But it's always about what's the big question we're trying to answer. So it's tempting to go in and find the solutions all the time. Um, and we're quite good at it. But actually stepping back and saying, what's the big question the business needs to ask? We use system thinking a lot. Again, if those of you who know it will know it's brilliant, it's a really good way of quickly getting to the heart of a problem and working out what your priorities are. We also work with Pop-Up Business School on these collaboration events. Um, and we've also got our first hackathon coming up in a couple of weeks' time, which is looking at our customer proposition. So we tend to get everyone together when we've got some big, juicy stuff to solve. And when I think about the stuff that has landed well and the stuff that takes off, it's the stuff where we've done this. I look at all the stuff which has faltered. It's where an expert has come along and said, you know what, I know the answer to this. Do what I tell you to. That's the stuff that hasn't worked so well. In terms of where we are now, we have more than doubled in size in two years. Our target was to be twice as big in three years. We've just hit half a billion in turnover. We have 24,000 colleagues now um, across the, uh, across, in, just in the UK alone. And then we're also partnered up with um, South Africa as well. So our retention has come down. Sorry, our retention has gone up. Our turnover has come down. And more people are being promoted internally. And so some of you will look at that and think, oh, 50%. Anyone think 50% turnover is quite a scary figure? Yeah? We have, um, out of our 24,000 colleagues, 19,000 of them are frontline cleaners, a lot of them in London. So again, it's a, it's a hard workforce. So even more reason why it's important that we have a YouTube philosophy in our business. I could not not talk about apprenticeships. I know they have got a little bit of a bad uh, reputation since the levy comes in. However, th this has been an incredible thing for, for our business. We love apprenticeships so much. We, it has its own department. It's even got its own name now. We've called it Hidden Talent. And we launched Hidden Talent in May this year through the levy. And we launched it through something called the 100 Club. So we said we've got 100 days to get 100, 100 apprenticeships signed up. It took us 43. We now have nearly 200 apprenticeship apprentices signed up. Our pot is about a million pounds. It's an investment fund as far as we're concerned, and we are committed to spending every single penny of it on our colleagues. We've already invested nearly 300,000 in people, and this month, this month alone, we've had not, uh, sorry, seven um, people join a, a level six degree in leadership and management. Laura is one of them. He's also in the, the audience. And we've had a couple of people from that original Navigator program signed up for their MBA. So we think they're fantastic. We just found out two days ago that we're now on the uh, register, register of training providers, so we can now self-deliver as well. So this is something that's going to be really interesting for our business. I could talk about this for hours, but it's clearly time I don't have. So before I give you my parting comments, can I take any questions, please? Ah, great question. Sorry, yes. Um, so she asked what the levy was. Those of us that aren't from the UK, if you could just explain what the levy is. So for companies who have a labour bill of over £3 million, 0.5% of their labour bill each month gets put into a levy pot, which we can then use to deliver apprenticeship training, which are government-funded qualifications. Yeah. So all of a sudden, we've got a million pounds more in our training budget. It's brilliant. Somebody has another question? Is it a hard one? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, some great stuff, some great ideas there. Um, I think you said, was it your CEO who tweeted at one point? If they were here today, how would they end the following statement? Um, the L&D team is fantastic. They've done some brilliant stuff. The one thing I'd want them to change is... Oh, that's a great question. <clears throat> um, 
they would say that I'd say about giving people more choice. Um, I think we have we've got now digital learning. We've got and we still do the classroom stuff. I think because of the scale of our business, classroom delivery does not work for the majority of our people. But I, I think it's maybe using technology a bit more. So we've just started using webinars. Um, God, I'm trying to think what she'd say. I haven't really answered your question. I'm aware of that. Um, Why don't you think about that for a bit? We'll okay. <laughs> You started up a learning and development team and rapidly had to make it available to everybody in the organization. How long did it take before you had something available for everybody? Um, it took us eight months to get Service Street up and running. Yeah. Um, the, learn the Service Champion started straight away within the first couple of months. And then, um, so I guess our view is when it comes, if we think about the management population, they're really the ones who we, we need to spend the most time in because they're the ones who are managing the teams, managing the client relationships. So it very quickly needed to be giving them the skills through service champions so they could then train their people. So I would say that that was our priority. Um, so I would say within six months, we started taking proper action about it. Thank you. I'm, I'm really interested in uh, how you engaged your employees with what you're doing, because you created a brilliant internal brand with Service Street. How much did your communications department support with that in terms of engaging staff and encouraging people to become learning champions across the organization? Yeah, again, a really good question. I think internal comms is a massive challenge for us. Because I can now say, I'll put something on Service Street, but if people don't know about Service Street, they, they can't find it. Um, so we've had to take a few different approaches. We do marketing e-shots, but we're aware that's not the only answer. Um, we communicate through our managers. Anytime any of the team are out in the business, we get ourselves booked onto most board meetings, senior team meetings, we talk about it. Um, so it's just constantly, um, we talk about it at induction. And, and, to, and if I'm honest, there's some elements that have taken quite a bit of time. I know when we first launched Service Street, and you almost think, oh, I'm gonna get, you know, you're going to get a standing ovation. This thing is fantastic. But actually, I had some senior managers saying, oh, it's never going to work. My people will never use this because they just want to make their money, go home, not interested. And do you know what? You have to say, you know your business better. But six months later when they make the decision actually this could be interesting so I think you have to give things a bit of time as well plus you send Joanne in and she gets them to see the the right way to do things <laughs> so it does take time you can't expect everyone to go this is great I'm just going to adopt it but lots of different ways and continually drip feeding information any other questions Not the okay so I guess in in summary um, my final, I guess what I've learned is I guess I used to think I needed to have all the answers and now actually it's, at, it's the questions that are most important for us. Um, I also strongly believe it's better to have a group of people behind an average idea than one person behind an amazing idea. And finally, development is a one-on-one -on -one sport and should be treated as such. I think the days of doing this kind of broad stuff for people, I think we need to give people choice. We need them to be able to access people in, in um, access information in a way that works well for them, and we need to support them. So if you'd like to know more, please come and join us, because as you know, we're always hiring. <laughs> <laughs>
um, us doing something which I thought we would never do, and that is make apprenticeships exciting. <laughs> All right, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. So I'd like to introduce you now to Lucy. Um, are you ready, Lucy? I am. You are? Hopefully okay. So one. Lucy is the Learning and Development Controller at Now TV, in case you haven't noticed. Um, and she's responsible for learning and development of uh, the customer-facing workforce. And she's transformed her team to deliver a digital-first learning strategy with keen emphasis on workplace learning, so learning in the workflow, and driving up engagement and performance. So, Lucy Davis. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hope you've had a good time at the Learning Tech Conference. Um, I'll probably rattle through my presentation, so don't worry. I know the, the drinks are coming at the end of this, so uh, I won't take up too much of your time. But hopefully, um, by sharing the story we've had for the last three years at Now TV, hopefully there'll be some interesting takeaways for you all. Um, so I've been at Now TV for three years. Um, as Julie said, I look after an operational um, team, so we're responsible for the customer-facing workforce. Um, and yeah, for the last three years, we have transformed the way the way we do things. I think the, the big focus areas I'll talk about is how we've made sure that we are fully aligned to the business, how we're working a lot um, more closely with our stakeholders, and we've really got a place at the table, as I think is an expression I heard earlier today, which I think is a really important one. Um, and the other focus has been trying to bring us up to date into 2018 um, and really look at how people want to learn, and digital has been a big part of that. For those of you who haven't heard of Now TV, just thought I'd quickly um, play uh, a quick ad just to get us out of Sylvester and into, uh, into Now TV, if the tech works. Welcome to Now TV, the streaming service where you can pick and choose from our four monthly passes. How can we help? Have you got a movie to entertain this lot? We've got over a thousand. <gasps> Sports. And SpongeBob SquarePants, please. We seek the finest shows from the sky of Atlantic. The shows you seek can be found here. <laughs> I'm having a sleepover. Could you suggest some movies? Hmm. Give me all the shows I've missed. Over. Here's 250 box sets. Over. Give me all the box sets you've got. Oh. Oh, hunky superhero movies, please. Pick the passes that are perfect for you and stream what you want each month with Now TV. Do you have a spa? I could kill for a facial. So that's Now TV. Have we got any Now TV customers in the room, actually? Or couple? Hopefully, good experience, yeah? Okay, good. Um, so Now TV's been around for um, five years. We're part of Sky, so we're owned by Sky. Um, and obviously have the opportunity to, um, to stream the fantastic uh, content that Sky offer. Um, just to, um, again, reiterate kind of the environment in which uh, my department operates. So we are an operational L&D team. Um, we're responsible at Now TV for the customer-facing team. So we've got three contact centers. Um, two overseas um, in India, in Bangalore and Mumbai, and we've also got a contact centre in Derry, um, some of our people there on the left. Um, and we also look after a small retail field team as well. Um, and I've, got a, I've got one of my team who has a bit of an interesting role because we also try and get learning out there for our third-party retailers as well. Um, so some of the retailers that we partner with are the likes of Dixon's Carphone, um, so the Curry's PC World Game, lots of grocers. So we also try and... Um, spread the word about Now TV, and we give those retailers direct access to our learning platform as well, which I'll talk a little bit more about. But to rewind to where we were in 2015, it feels like it's the topical, topical year. Um, so three years ago, when I started Now TV, where were we? So I inherited uh, quite a small team, um, I'd say probably traditional um, trainers, and the, the landscape had changed, they'd kind of been recruited as, um, as trainers, really, as people that would deliver a lot of inductions, predominantly inductions, I would say. Um, the landscape changed. We moved one of our contact centers, and the delivery team sat elsewhere. So those trainers were then propelled into suddenly having to design training. Um, that was very much self-directed. Let's put everything on PowerPoint. <laughs> and when I arrived, I've never seen so much PowerPoint in my life. I think the first three days of our inductions were over 300 PowerPoint slides. 
Uh, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> Nearly killed my laptop on that first day. Um, all the training was delivered in the classroom. That was really the only option. Um, training was slow to produce. It was slow to deliver. And if I'm honest, it wasn't particularly engaging. I remember... Um, Sorry, I've already said, sorry, I was going to repeat something then. Um, Solution-wise, we did have a learning management system that we were using for part of our retail teams, um, but not within our contact centres. And as soon as I got my hands on it, I could see why. It was very, very, you know, um, slow, clunky, and everything why the words LMS sometimes send shivers down people's spines in terms of being quite a, a slow, unresponsive system. Um, a couple of my team had started producing e-learning, but it was very much click next. A PowerPoint slide turned into pretty bad e-learning. And in terms of alignment um, with the business, the team were very reactive, um, just trying to keep their heads above uh, water, very much order takers. So it wasn't in a particularly good place. So I guess fast forward three years... I'm going to go into detail about each of these, but just in terms of where we are today. We're by no means perfect. We do have a lot still to do. <laughs> um, but we've definitely, we've definitely moved things forward. So we have a specialist team, particularly as far as digital design is concerned. Um, we operate more as uh, a consultative function. Um, we have business partners um, that very much do have that kind of place at the table in terms of uh, being able to operate at a more strategic level. We have a fantastic, I'm going to say, CMS, contact management, um, content management system, um, where we host um, our digital learning. Our learning offer is digital first. Uh, we don't have to rely on classroom training. And we've also introduced some agile ways of working, um, which have definitely given us huge benefit and reward. Um, what's that led to? Definitely a better experience for those customer-facing teams. Um, definitely less pressure on them in terms of being able to access learning far easier, far quicker. Definitely um, greater engagement in learning um, and also a reduction in time in the classroom. So there's definitely been huge cost savings in terms of taking people in a contact centre environment offline. So how have we done all of this? Okay, in terms of the team, um, I did restructure the department. Um, focusing on what skills we needed in order to meet um, our business goals. Obviously, before even touching the team, it was very much a case of looking at our strategy. What, what strategy did we need in L&D? What was our customer service strategy? What were the goals of the organization? What were the specific customer service goals? And where were we taking that customer-facing workforce? So what did that look like in the next two, three years? What was coming up in our product roadmap? Off the back of that, um, I designed the, the strategy um, and then looked at what skills do we actually need in order to meet that. The key areas I would say that would come up at a high level um, out of that strategy were, first of all, operating, as I said before, as a more um, consultative function and introducing business partner roles. Um, and secondly, digital learning being really front and centre. Digital first for us at Now TV doesn't mean digital only. And actually, for a couple of people in my team, you know, they weren't quite sure what, what's this digital all about and does that mean that you know, we can't have memorable interactions face to face? Absolutely not. It's about actually, for example, in our contact center environment, you know, we've, we've launched, we're about to launch a couple of exciting things. We've just launched uh, now broadband proposition this week, a new flexible broadband offer. And uh, we've just announced that we're going to be launching a streaming stick as well. For um, the you know, if we were going to bring everyone in the classroom, it would take us weeks and weeks to get everyone up to speed. Um, and through our learning platform, it meant we could actually start to do almost like a marketing campaign around that. And I'll show you a couple of examples of some of the content we've produced. Um, but it gives us the opportunity just to start drip feeding information in quite an exciting and interesting way. Um, and that's made a big difference. I'd say the key roles that we've introduced that have made the biggest difference are business partners. Um, digital learning manager, Dominic. Everyone needs a Dominic in their life. He has um, absolutely been able to drive our digital strategy forward um, and also bringing in some digital design expertise. Um, I've touched on the business partner role. 
that we've, we've got a business partner that looks after both, um, so one that looks after contact centre and one that looks after our retail teams, works very, very closely with our stakeholders. Um, the, in terms of looking at how priorities line up, you know, that is not a once a quarter conversation. It's not even once a month conversation. It's really making sure that they are, they are seen as an extension of their management team. Um, and in the fast paced world and now TV, priorities can change as quick as weekly. So really making sure we're ahead of the curve when it comes to knowing where priorities are. Having a transparent roadmap and making sure that those priorities are absolutely front and centre and visible to our stakeholders. Um, and making sure that there's a forum where we get to talk about challenges and kind of discuss how we move things forward together. Um, so we talked about digital. So now TV Geek Zone, we commissioned a company called Digital Balance to actually design us a bespoke um, I don't like to use the word LMS. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to call it a content management system. Um, but it's interesting, Lisa, I think you said the same about Sylvester Street. You know, in terms of branding it, you certainly didn't want to call it a learning platform or a learning portal or anything that doesn't sound very engaging. Um, that was very much, you know, when it comes to branding, um, what we ended up with as Geek Zone, it was really, really important. Obviously, our brand, as you've seen, is quite fun. It's quite vibrant. We've got a young um, workforce. So, and we're quite a cheeky, playful brand, so we wanted to make sure it kind of lined up with that. Um, we actually use GeekZone as a bit of a central hub as well. So as well as hosting learning content on it, we also use it as, I guess, like a bit of an intranet. And again, we don't use the intranet word. <laughs> um, but it's an opportunity to share what content's coming up, to share news of, of, of kind of people initiatives, um, and any kind of fast-paced news that advisors need to know as well. So it is a bit of a kind of a, a hub for everything. In terms of the content that goes on to GeekZone, what we've um, done with the platform is made it very focused around the user experience. It doesn't take you many clicks to get into content. We've tried to um, make sure it's very much about bite-sized um, pieces of content, whether it's um, an infographic, whether it's a short video, um, you can get into that content really, really quickly. So this is just sort of a screenshot of uh, one of our sections around all the Now TV passes. I was going to show you a couple of um, examples of content as well. I mean, on the right there's just kind of a one pager for um, our teams to get up to speed with what the Cinema Pass offers, and. I will play a video. Now, this video is um, a troubleshooting video that's used as part of our induction. So, In this video, we'll show you how to soft reset the box. This helps return the box to a working state, may fix temporary error codes, and help to reconnect the box to your network. From the home screen, <laughs> scroll down to settings, Then scroll down to System, then scroll down to System Restart, and select Restart. Duh! Alternatively, you can find the reset button on the back or the underside of the box and press that instead. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So. That's, that's sort of one example of a suite of videos that we designed around troubleshooting. And I think you, heard, you saw on the slide before around designing for the workplace, not for the classroom. I think that's been really, really key for us. Um, so rather than in the past with all our 300 slide PowerPoints and information only being available in that classroom and having to rely on memory recall, what we're trying to do is have complete transparent learning resources that are available whenever people need them, um, completely um, with Lisa as well in terms of making them readily available for all. Um, we're in the process at the moment of basically trying to take all of our various induction programs and turn them into um, bite-sized modules that can be used um, as part of onboarding, can also be used uh, at any point really, whether it's self-directed learning, 
um, and our advisors just um, brushing up on their knowledge, um, or whether it's a case of a team leader wanting to do something with their team because there's a particular area that everyone's struggling. Um, that's one example of a resource. I guess I talked a bit earlier about if we were launching something new, we try to look at it almost like a, a marketing or a learning campaign for our advisors. So now broadband is something that we launched, I think yesterday, in fact, this week. <laughs> and we released some resources to our advisors um, two weeks ago. And we sort of did a bit of a drip feed on Geek Zone, um, as well as other face-to-face um, -face engagement activities, posters, some, some excited, um, exciting kind of um, different drop-in sessions to talk about it. Um, but here's an example of one of the videos that form part of the campaign. What I should say about these videos as well is they're all um, produced in-house by my team. So we've got some fantastic um, digital media skills um, and some great working practices around templates that means actually videos like this can be produced really, really quickly. Um, and it really creates a bit of a buzz as well when, when we need to get people excited and win their hearts and minds over um, when we're going to be launching new products and services. So those are a couple of examples when I talk about resources. I think the other thing that's been really, really key for us is um, dabbling in the world of Agile. I'm not going to profess to be an Agile expert. I know it's been talked about a little bit at this conference, and I know that there are presentations that could go on for days around it. Um, what I'd say we've done is um, we've spent some time um, with technology teams at Sky. Um, there's also the head of learning for kind of our non um, so our, our, our sort of our group service functions um, at Sky was the person that inspired me because she first of all started to get her team uh, to work in an agile way. And as soon as she spent some time with that team, you couldn't help but love the way they worked. And so we've stolen some of those, um, those approaches. And the biggest, the biggest things we do is we prioritize weekly. So we have a big picture board with everything that's coming up in terms of our, our workload. And we have the project we're working on right now. And then we have a backlog. And that backlog is ordered in the way we think we're going to do things. But in the fast-paced world of now TV, that can change very, very quickly. So literally weekly, we'll be talking about what we're going to do next week. And that can change. We also get our design team um, who produce the content on Geek Zone or produce any of our face-to-face -face workshops. They will, for any of our meaty projects, operate in design sprint teams. And so that means we will decide either a one-week sprint or a two-week sprint. Everyone will be on it. Um, that will be the pure focus. There might be a bit of BAU work they've got to pick up around it, but 90% of their day will be focused on, on this project. And the results are just magical. <laughs> I remember the first time I was almost being the scrum master for a sprint around Easter. Um, given that it was Easter week, I think we were down to four days. And by the end of that four days with everyone on it, we produced like an internet page, two videos, five one-pagers, a workshop. <laughs> and it was just incredible to see what could be produced in such a short space of time. Um, because you've got everyone working so closely, just the collaboration, the creativity, where people can bounce off each other is quite infectious. We've um, taken some agile tools. So the tools that work for us is Trello, such a simple program. I'm sure many of you use it. Um, but in, in order to put the work up there, and allow the guys to almost self-manage and make sure we can move things along the board. And Slack. Anyone use Slack? Love Slack. Slack is, um, I guess it's like a messaging tool. Um, so it's almost like a great big WhatsApp. Um, and so for every project, we set up its own channel. And we can just have open communication um, around a project. We do still talk face to face. <laughs> but we've banned email. And rather than email being quite slow and clunky, as an internal team, all of our communication is on Slack. So it's really open and transparent for everyone to see. Um, and that's made a huge difference, because we've also got a remote team. So it works really, really well for us. 
I think the other big thing that Agile does is, you know, for any of you who do work in operational environments, I'm sure, again, the changes are thick and fast. By the time you design something, there's been changes. So, you know, cutting it, I say cutting it a bit fine, but designing closer to when something's about to launch, you know, if, for example, it's, it's a new product that we've got to get people up to speed on, it means it's really quick to make changes within, within that sprint or even post that sprint as well. So I'm about to wrap up, but I guess you know, those are some of our, the key things that have made a huge difference to us. We still, I mean, the list of challenges could go on and on and on, really. I just picked out a couple. Um, I'd say the introduction of business partners means that we are able to be much more proactive. We've definitely driven a lot of ideas, brought ideas to the table, taken them forward. Um, however, you know, working in, in media, it means that there's constantly new products coming, new exciting features. So I would say we're, you know, we are still very stretched at capacity and always building business case for more resource. Um, getting closer to our people, um, I think what works really well is during a design sprint, if we're speaking to that end user, the, um, the advisors who are speaking to our customers who need to apt, uh, actually um, get up to speed, you know, how do they want to learn, what do they need, what resources are going to be useful to really support their performance. I think we rely a little bit too much on uh, some of the, maybe like our trainers on, in our contact centers, and it's a little bit of third-hand feedback. So one of the focus areas I've set my team is how do we get closer and have that direct dialogue between the design team um, and our users. Oh, our users are people, horrible word. <laughs> um, Geek Zone adoption. We've got a really high adoption in India. Um, India really excited um, to be able to get their hands on more information and get greater accessibility to learning. Um, we've got a contact center in Derry that we introduced Geek Zone to probably halfway after it launched. So probably those people that were there before launch are not as, as engaged as those that have come afterwards. So we're looking at how do we make sure it's a place that people want to come to and not feel that they're forced to. Um, I was thinking, what other challenges? I think definitely, definitely a challenge is looking at how do we demonstrate the value to the business. Um, I've got a new um, sort of senior management teams, there's been a few reshuffles um, internally. So we've got a new operations director, for example. Um, I'm keen to kind of um, work with him around how do we demonstrate value, especially from the digital learning side of things. I think it'll be around consumption and engagement uh, with the portal, but making sure that I'm talking the same language as he wants to hear. And also, how do we encourage self-directed learning in a contact center environment? You know, I think contact centers, for those of you who've either worked there or um, have organizations that have contact centers, you know, it, they are quite constrained. You know, you have a shift pattern, you've got to be at your desk ready to speak to those customers or live chat those customers. So it's a different environment. I'm really passionate about self-directed learning and creating a learning culture, but obviously um, different contact centers are, are slightly different. So I've got to have that buy-in across the board and make sure that we're working together to say, is that the environment we want to create, and how do we do that, and how do we encourage our team leaders to be nurturing that kind of environment? So that brings me to the end of my presentation. What questions have you got for me? Any questions from the floor? Stunned no. to silence. No, well, I've, about got, the I've got one for you. <laughs> I'd like to know more about your business, these business partners that sure. you've set up, and I'd like to understand how you get them to engage with the business? Well, it's, it's an interesting one. It's, it's, you know, I think we've got one business area that's more engaged than the other. And I think I've been working really, really closely with that, with that particular business partner to, to say, look, you've got to earn your place at that table. <laughs> it's not a case that, you know, you're just automatically going to get time with them. Um, so it's, it's really uh, closeness to their business areas, really understanding their priorities and getting to those important meetings that, you know, you're really, you're really sort of able to, A, understand, you know, what's important to them, and B, you know, start to demonstrate the value. And are you being supported with the um, budget for what you're doing? Yes. Luckily, when I, when I came in, um, probably about two and a half, three years into now TV, so it was when a lot of money was being in, invested. So I came in at a good time and was able to spend the money 
on getting things like geeks and up to speed, I would say that the budget's not you know, going to continually be like that. So I know there was a session, I think, earlier today about how do you operate on a lean budget, and I missed that session. But I, I can definitely see that the money will be less available in the future. Can you? OK, great. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? No? OK, well, I'm going to say thank you very much to uh, Lucy.